I'm completing the entire mainline Pokemon franchise in chronological order with two challenges standing in front of me. The first, we're doing a hardcore Nuzlocke in all 39 mainline Pokemon games released in North America, and the second, no repeat Pokemon may be used. If I use Starly and Brilliant Diamond, I can't use it in Shining Pearl, Legends Arceus, or anywhere else. Same goes for every single Pokemon. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any parts of this series, and since we're making the push to 200,000 subscribers with your help by the end of 2023. Also, since we're getting to the end of this series soon, I really would appreciate suggestions in the comments below of what challenges I should try after the franchise Nuzlocke is done. And if you want to get your challenge in as an official request, feel free to use the $50 Super Thanks tier under the video and leave a comment with your request. Let's get right into it. So, since we're walking into the last set of remakes for this series, we're once again at a loss for starters. No Turtwig, Chimchar, or Piplup, so what are we going to be using for our encounters? Well, once we get Pokeballs and the Nuzlocke proper begins, we're going to be hopping over to Route 201 to capture a Starly. Thankfully, we reserved this and Bidoof, both respectively for Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, so they'll be our starters for these go-arounds. We can go ahead and EV train Starly in attack and speed, so I do so with a bunch of level 2 Starly on Route 201 for speed starting out, getting up to level 9 before heading up to Route 202 and into Jubilife City to give Barry a town map, then we can head north into Route 204 for our second encounter in Budu. I wanted to make sure I left a Pokemon that could easily take out Rourke for both games as well, and thankfully Psyduck in Ravage Path is something I can easily leave for Shining Pearl. However, I'm going to need to max out the friendship on Badoo immediately at level 4, so that upon evolution into Roselia at level 5, we can learn Mega Drain, since otherwise we're going to be stuck with Absorb for a bit. This requires way too much running around, but it is possible, so once we level it up on a few level 2 Starlies, it evolves and it can be EV trained all the way to level 14, entirely on speed since we still don't have enough room for the special attack EVs, which would be on Route 203 if we wanted to get some there. However, we can't get there until we take out Barry, so after EV training Starly some more and speed up to level 12, we're good to take him down. With that level advantage, his Starly is a one-shot with wing attack, while Turtwig takes two despite it being super effective, setting up a useless withdraw in between. Now that is actually the last required battle before Rourke, so I'm good to send Rourke packing back to the Orberg Gym and demolish him with Roselia, using Leech Seed and Mega Drain on Geodude to maximize our healing due to Sturdy, though it actually doesn't have Sturdy if I had done my research, then setting up a few growths in the face of Onyx after setting up Leech Seed, taking a few rock throws in the process, all in the effort to make Kranidos a one-shot with Mega Drain, which it is, and I earn the Coal Badge in the process. Quick work there, so back to EV training we go. With the level cap increased to 22, I finally have enough flexible EXP to finish up training Roselia on level 4 Abras, and then Starly on level 3 Shinxes for the physical attack stat, so I can quit dawdling around in the beginning of the game and finally get moving. However, since we're still in Gen 8, that automatic EXP share is still a pain in the bum, so I'll need to swap between Staravia and Roselia from the box depending on the fight to make sure I don't overlevel either of them. With one exception, of course, that being Mars in the Valley Windworks. This is a simple endeavor, though, leading Roselia against Zubat so that it gets set up Leech Seed before she goes for U-Turn. Well then, so much for that, I thought it was going to be Supersonic here. She goes immediately into Perugly, but that's fine as I can swap into Staravia, getting Intimidate up, and absorbing that Fake Out damage, swapping back into Roselia on a Thief for around a quarter damage. From here, we can easily set up a Leech Seed and Stun Spore, then set up some Growths, all while Perugly is basically helpless. Getting six of them off before KOing Perugly with Mega Drain, then hitting Zubat for nearly a one-shot despite the quad resistance, hitting Supersonic. Well, out we go since Growth also increases physical attack, so I just bring in Staravia and KO with Quick Attack to win the day. <sighs> Professor, I'm trying to sneak through Route 205, but the flap of Staravia's wings keeps alerting the trainers! After that nonsense, we're in and out of Eterna Forest in no time, getting into Eterna City and gaining the most game-breaking item of them all, the Explorer Kit. Now, do you remember how Sword and Shield had all of those endgame TRs available in the wild area? Yeah, the Grand Underground is basically the same thing, just a bit more tedious. You need spheres from the mining minigame to obtain these TMs, which rotate daily, but you can also get every type boosting plate as well as the skull or armor fossil depending on your version here, so it's not that boring. Not to mention, we get the encounters here too. First two are Baneri from the Spacious Cave and Gligar from the Rocky Cave. However, I'm not quite pulling these in since these are last resorts. Reason for that being that, well, both of them are actually way more relevant in Legends Arceus, not to mention the latter, upon further research, cannot evolve until the post-game. 
Yeah, for some reason they locked the Razor Fang behind the post game, but not the Razor Claw. Uh, really strange and depressing too, since I really wanted to use Gliscor, as it's a pretty unappreciated mon and with a really nice typing of ground flying. Either way though, I at least can grab Smoochum from the Dazzling Cave, getting Eevee trained in special attack and speed naturally, and Scyther from Big Bluff Cavern. Now, you might be wondering if I'm going to use Scyther, and that is an absolute no. We can get around this easily though, because the Smoochum that we caught has the move Covet, which is basically a normal type thief. And with Magnemites running around down here, it's only a matter of time before I get the 5% Metal Coat, giving me access to Scizor before the second gym, all while not using Scyther. This of course will be Eevee Train in attack and speed, plus with all of the crazy TMs you can get from the small and large fear traders, we are in business. X Scissor, Aerial Ace, Swords Dance, Brick Break, not to mention Priority Bullet Punch on Evolution, gives us one of the best Pokemon in the game at this point in time. I didn't even have to grab Houndoom to destroy Gardenia with. Well, I guess I really am spoiling Shining Pearl's encounters at this point, but still, we are rolling in the winds here, folks. I do also make sure to talk to all of the NPCs I can at this point in the Grand Underground, as we'll need to talk to all 32 of them to get access to a fun little friend soon enough. Anyway, enough about the Grand Underground. Gardenia's a piece of cake thanks to Scizor, not even needing to set up Sword Stance to KO Cherubi, Turtwig, and Roserade all in one shot with a Skyplate boosted Aerial Ace each to win. Now that is what I call power. There was one other thing I was considering doing as well before going into the Galactic Headquarters here, and that was grabbing a squad of Pachirisu. See, these guys have pickup, and if they're above level 21, which now that we've beaten Gardenia, they do end up spawning at above level 21 down in the Grand Underground, and therefore have a 4% chance of getting shiny stones and a 1% chance of getting leftovers due to pickup. Now, of course, you're probably tired of the latter, and honestly, I think it wouldn't be in spirit of the challenge to grab a whole squad of unusable pickup Pokemon, even though it would be nice to evolve Roselia already, but that's fine. We can wait until that's obtainable in Iron Island, and I'll stick with the plate items for now. They seem to be doing the trick after all, though, since with Jupiter standing in my way, Scizor does just the trick again, one-shotting her lead Zubat with Aerial Ace, and despite Skuntank having a quad-effect of Flamethrower, Scizor is way too bulky at this point in the game to even care, two-shotting with an Insect Plate boosted X Scissor through a Citrus Berry to win the fight single-handedly. Not gonna lie, I'm excited about how this team is turning up. Everybody's a dual type with nothing overlapping at this point with normal flying, grass poison, ice psychic, bug steel, not to mention all of that immense power bundled into everything. Or will be bundled into everything once we get Smoochum to level 30. Thankfully, there isn't much in the way until we get to Heart Home City, as after we talk to Fantina and Joanna, we're good to fight Barry again. I will give Sinnoh some credit here though, they do know how to space the rival battles pretty well. He leads with... Starly? Dude, that thing evolved at level 14. I mean, that makes my life easier since Scizor can just destroy this team, using Aerial Ace to KO both Starly and Ponyta, then X Scissor to take out Weasel and Grottle with no damage on my end. And with that, we're free to enter Route 209 and add two more unique typings to the team. Well, after grabbing strength from the Lost Tower, I can fit the odd keystone into its intended slot and run into Spiritomb, adding the Dark and Ghost type defensive powerhouse to the team. I'm Eevee training this in Defense and Special Defense, basically so that it can play the same role that Orbeetle did back in Sword version. While it can't get screens, it sure as hell can get Calm Mind as well as a great assortment of special attacks in Dark Pulse, Shadow Ball, Psychic, and Shockwave, so I think we're in great hands. One trek through routes 210 and 215 later, and we're in Veilstone to obtain some more of those massively powerful TMs that weren't available in the Grand Underground, finally nabbing up the likes of Ice Beam and Psychic for Smoochum, and just in time since that level cap of 30 is calling my name. However, since the cap for both Maylene and Crasher Wake is the same, I'm making sure to clear out the drainers in Veilstone Gym on routes 212 and 213, as well as in Wake's Gym just to ensure that I don't overlevel going in between them, and so I can have as much of a level advantage as I can going into both. Now with Maylene, I'm fine going in at level 29 due to having a ghost type on the team, though with Scizor and Aerial Ace, this shouldn't even be needed. She leads off with Metatite, so I go with Scizor, setting up sword stances in the face of bulk up, but then she goes for Drain Punch on my second usage, doing a little less than half. Well then, this surely should be fine, as I can use Roost to heal that off and hope for a bulk up since she can't out damage me, even with a critical hit, and sure enough, next turn I get to full HP with Roost, she uses bulk up, and my plus 4 super effective Skyplate boosted Aerial Ace is more than enough to topple her plus 2 defense, KOing it as well as Machoke in one shot to lead to Lucario. 
She does outspeed here and hit Drain Punch, but just like Metatite, it does less than half, leading to the Aerial Ace one-shot on the Crackback to win. Awesome, and with her out of the way, Smoochum finally evolves into Jinx, and I can take on Crash or Wake. Spiritomb is actually the best course of action here in my opinion, since I can easily wipe out Gyarados with two Shockwaves, the first bringing Gyarados to healing range, letting me get off a Calm Mind before KOing with a second, though two bites do come my way. Thank you Defense Stat, those did not hurt at all. Second out is Quagsire, and Stab Dark Pulse is more than enough to two-shot him, as Rain Dance is his move of choosing, boosting the last Pokemon Floatzel's speed due to Swift Swim. Not that it matters though, Spiritomb has base 30 speed, so we're never outspeeding anything that isn't named Gastrodon. Thankfully though, his Aqua Jet only does around a quarter, letting Spiritomb finish the fight with a Zap Plate boosted super effective Shockwave to win. Four Gym Badges down, four to go, but Barry's in my way of getting to that damn fifth Gym Badge quickly. Damn, he really should have interrupted me after Maylene, so I could have done the Ha Ha Shadow the Hedgehog joke, but it just falls flat. Anyway, this fight is made very easy thanks to Spiritomb, since I can set up Calm Mind all I want. As soon as I'm done with all those, double teams go to waste with his lead. Starly, again, why is this thing not evolved? KOing with Shockwave, and then doing the same to Weasel and Ponyta with Dark Pulse as they both outspeed and use Tail Whip, leaving just Grottle. I'm not too keen leaving Spiritomb out at minus two defense against a physical attacker though, even with high defense, so it's out the Scizor to KO with the next Scissor to end the fight. Sorry Barry, you need to evolve your Pokemon. It's not that difficult, just stop pressing B. But with him and the Galactic Run out of the way, we run Cynthia's errand, get Surf, and head on back to Heart Home City to use it in battle by taking out Fantina. She leads off with Drift Limb, so I go with Scizor, setting up three sword stances back to back as she goes for Strength Sap, taking one of those attack boosts away, Hex, which doesn't do much damage, and Will-O-Wisp, thankfully negated by my held Rossberry. From here, it's an easy one shot with Thief, taking a quarter HP in damage thanks to Aftermath and leading to Gengar. She goes immediately for Confuse Ray, pretty good strategy against a Pokemon with monstrous attack at the moment, but Scizor cuts through and KOs with Thief, leaving just Miss Magius. Of course, I'm kind of expecting Phantom Force here, and sure enough, it is that move, with Scizor not hitting itself in confusion once again. Then, once Phantom Force connects, Scizor finally snaps out and hits Thief for the one-shot KO and the win. I'm not even gonna lie to you, I was not looking at the game during this fight. I think I was watching some low art videos in the Archie Sonic comics, which I'd actually highly recommend you check out. The link will be in the iCard on the top right-hand corner of your screen if you're interested. But yeah, that was far too risky, probably should have swapped for Spiritomb and just finished it from there, but hey, we made it through, can't ask for more. Now with Fancina out of the way, I can use Surf outside of battle, uh, that doesn't mean much with our next encounter, as it is a Rod encounter. I grabbed the good Rod back on Route 209 earlier for this moment, finally fishing on Route 218 for our 6th team member Infineon, evolving into Luminion quickly after being EV trained in special attack and speed. It's not great. It's a water type, and that's really all I'm asking for here in preparation for Byron. But before I'm allowed to fight him, here comes Barry with a swing and a miss. Yeah, he's at least evolved as Starly, but he really could have used that evolution into Staraptor here. He probably also could have used the evolution into Floatzel. And for... What? Why? Why is this not a Torterra? Yeah, either way, Scizor sweeps once again, setting up three sword stances through Intimidate, healing with Roost, then KOing with Bullet Punch through three double teams. It's just a skill issue, folks. Just simply will the attack to hit, and it'll happen. Ponyta, X Scissor gone. Heracross, Bullet Punch, dead. Buizel, again, why is this thing not evolved to get off my screen? And last but not least, Grottle, which I have already complained about not being a Torterra. Die to X Scissor, you do not belong on my bridge. Now since Scizor is level 38, I'm boxing it for this gym since while, well, yes, the level cap is 39, it increases to 42 for the next gym leader and I'm not exactly keen on that small of an increase when the untoggable EXP share is in play, along with a few more galactic grunt and admin run-ins. Thankfully, Luminion and Roselia are more than enough to pull their own weight for Byron, getting me in with Spiritomb against his lead, Bronzor. Now, oddly enough, this Bronzor is slower than Spiritomb, so... I honestly thought that Spiritomb was going to be slower, and then Trick Room was going to backfire, but that's not the case, as I set up Calm Mind and he goes for Sandstorm. And I continue to go for it as I run out the turns of Light Screen and Sandstorm, taking some chip damage as well as some Flash Cannons that barely do a thing, all while getting confused with Confuse Ray. It's a bit of chip damage, but it only adds up to about a third by the time Spiritomb snaps out and hits Dark Pulse for the KO, leading to Steelix. With both Light Screen and Trick Room down though, it's easy enough to hit Dark Pulse, flinch, and KO with the second one. Alright, full restore, I guess two more will suffice. 
Oh, a hyper potion. Wow, they actually know how to program them to have different items. I guess that's neat, but still, Steelix cannot outspeed, and it goes down to two more Dark Pulses to leave just Bastiodon. Now, while you'd think this is just kind of a dire circumstance, and I need to swap, uh, this thing can't attack worth a damn even with Stone Edge, so I'm free to just sit here and click Dark Pulse, doing well over half as the Citrus Berry brings him back to around half, hitting Stone Edge for, like I expected, pitiful damage, going down to the second Dark Pulse and netting me the Mine Badge. Yeah, the badge is mine. See you later, dork. Tell your son that his mother should have swallowed him. Now then, I guess I probably should have done this before Byron, but screw it. I'm kind of just winging this entire game. I gotta head through Iron Island and complete Riley's story not for the egg, but for the item laying beyond him, and that's the shiny stone. Finally giving me the long-awaited evolution to Roserade and putting the team at full power, ready to crush the rest of the game. While I'm sitting through the library cutscene before the galactic bomb goes off, my mind is pretty much not in the game at this point and thinking about the most ridiculous of topics. For instance, in Power Rangers, both Rita and Lord Zed know the identities of the Rangers, know who their parents are, and where they go to school. So why don't they just send putties with guns to kill them? I can just imagine the sound of Alpha calling one of the Rangers just before it happens, and it's just like, Billy! He's got a gun! <laughs> Speaking of which, I've got to take some time to watch Cosmic Fury now that it's out on Netflix. Tangents aside, the Galactic Admins don't stand a chance, with Saturn basically falling to Scizor despite his best efforts to set up with Reflect, taking out Kadabra with X Scissor, doing the same to Toxicroak with two of them after recovering a bit with Roost, then finally Bronzor with one more X Scissor. Mars goes just as easily, as her lead Golbat doesn't have any moves to confuse Scizor with, so I just set up, then hit Bullet Punch on Golbat, X Scizor on Perugly, and then do the same to Bronzor after three sword stances, winning the fight. Jupiter isn't fighting us again though, and we won't even see her until after we head up to Snowpoint City and take on... Actually, I don't even remember this girl's name and can't be bothered to look it up. Feel free to let me know what fits in her mouth in the comments below. <laughs> I can't even say that with a straight face. She leads off with Snover, so I'm going with Spiritomb, basically just setting up Calm Mind and using Rest to recover all of these Avalanche uses and nullify them. Pressure really helps here in burning through all of her power points too, eventually getting her to use Water Pulse, so I'm able to get near full HP because of all of those special defense boosts, before going for the sweep of course. KOing Snover, Sneasel, and Metacham all with one Shadow Ball apiece, while taking some chip damage from Metacham thanks to a Thunder Punch, leaving just a Bomb Snow. I'm just over half HP at this point as she sets up Aurora Veil, so I can't quite one-shot with plus six Shadow Ball anymore, but it does over half, though not nearly enough for it to still be a two-shot after the Citrus Berry, so it's just up to stalling with rest until Aurora Veil ends, taking a few Earthquakes and Giga Drains before it finally elapses, Spiritomb wakes up, and I'm able to KO with Shadow Ball to win the fight. Easily done, now to chase off Jupiter and take on the last Bastion of Team Galactic and Veilstone and Spear Pillar. The first battle against Cyrus is comedy in terms of ease, as Jinx can literally one-shot everything with super effective attacks, taking out Murkrow with Ice Beam, Golbat with Psychic so hard that the game glitches out, then doing the same to Sneasel with Focus Blast as we both miss our attacks on the first go, KOing and leading to Saturn straight after. Thankfully, Scizor does the same job here, KOing Kadabra with X Scissor, Toxicroak with two, and then Bronzor with one more X Scissor. Alright, now that they're cornered to Spear Pillar, the double battle against Mars and Jupiter, while hectic, is pretty simple to describe. Basically just trying to focus on one side before handling the other, aiming to take out Mars' team so that myself and Barry can double team Jupiter. Uh, and no, that does not mean double penetration, you perverted f I know you were thinking it, it takes one to know what Lumenion's able to do quite a bit of work with Surf, taking out both Bronzors as well as doing decent damage to both Perugly and Golbat before Staraptor nearly KOs Perugly with close combat, leaving Lumenion to KO it while also taking out Staraptor in the process with Surf. Collateral damage, what can I say? However, as Mars brings in her last Pokemon in Golbat, Barry brings in... a level 42... Weasel. Why the hell is this thing not a Floatzel yet? I have asked this three times already, and you have still yet to give me an answer. Anywho, I swap Luminion out for Spiritomb as Weasel starts going for Tail Whip. Wow, you are even more useless than I thought. So I can just start going for Psychic with Spiritomb on Mars' Golbat, leaving his replacement Ponyta to KO with Flame Wheel, finally singling out Jupiter so that both her Golbat and Skuntank go down to a myriad of Shadow Balls and Flame Wheels, with the latter dealing the finishing blow and letting me evade the Aftermath ability in time for Cyrus' final face-off. He's once again rather simple, even with his additional evolutions and fourth Pokemon. Honchkrow is a simple two-shot with Luminion's Ice Beam leading to Gyarados, so I swap to Spiritomb, 
tanking Earthquake and two Waterfalls while being able to deal out a Shadow Ball for around a quarter, but unfortunately the second isn't able to connect because the second Waterfall gets a flinch. So I swap into Roserade for Giga Drain, doing half to Gyarados before a Waterfall Ice Fang combo brings Roserade down to low yellow HP and freezing in the process. Well, that sucks, but I guess I can go out into Scizor and then tank some hits and set up Sword Stances. Sure enough, this works in the face of all those physical attacks, letting me set up and heal with Roost, then finish off Gyarados with X Scissor, Weavile with Bullet Punch, and finally Crobat also with Bullet Punch to win. With access to Dialga though, I Master Ball it, throw it into the box, and leave it there to rot, only so that it can disturb me again in two games' time. Now I can breathe a little thanks to all the story nonsense being taken care of, finally being able to make the last few strides of progress needed to reach Shining Pearl. Of course, that includes taking on the last gym leader, Volkner, and with Spiritomb, this is oddly enough an easy fight. I figured Raichu was just gonna be a bum and use Nuzzle straight away to make me need to use Rest and stall him out of his Nuzzle power points, but oddly enough, he goes straight for Volt Switch as I go for Calm Mind, bringing in Ambipom who literally cannot hit Spiritomb with anything other than Thunderbolt, a non-stab special attack that's just getting utterly walled by Calm Mind. So much so that even through two critical hits, I'm able to get to plus six, heal with Rest, then start KOing like mad. Psychic for Ambipom, Shadow Ball for... Ra I mean Octillery, uh, Shadow Ball for Raichu, okay, I guess he's just letting this happen, Luxray, and finally, after using the nuzzle I came prepared for, Spiritomb's able to roll the 75% chance needed to hit Shadow Ball and KO Raichu, unable to escape with Volt Switch to win the fight. One victory road later, which goes very easy thanks to the level cap going from 49 to 63, so it's very easy to just overlevel and steamroll everybody, it's time for Barry in the five league battles. However, again with the level cap being as high as it is, I'm literally 12 levels higher than his lead star after with my own, so I just sit here and set up 6 workups after being inflicted with Intimidate at the start of the battle, doing so through a bunch of close combats, though I get cut off from setting up the 7th because he opted to go for U-turn into Rapidash. That's fine, plus 5 should be enough, so I just start wailing from there with Aerial Ace, KOing Rapidash, Heracross, Floatzel, after he gets the Quick Claw proc for Ice Fang, doing only around 40% damage, <laughs> I guess it didn't matter if it evolved, then Snorlax comes in fourth, eats a close combat, and with Staraptor back in, I figured I could steal another bit of HP from Roost while he wastes a turn with Sunny Day. I guess it makes sense considering he has both Rapidash and Torterra, but the former is dead and that would also require Torterra having Solar Beam, which it doesn't. So both Staraptor and Torterra fall to one Aerial Ace apiece to win me the fight, giving me the freedom to get to level 63 and challenge the league. Eren's a very simple endeavor, being a bug user whose ace is 8 levels lower than Lucian's, so I just lead with Staraptor with a Petcha Berry to get a free workup in before he goes for Toxic, only to sweep from there. But uh, he decides to go for Bug Buzz like 5 times while I set up, only getting Staraptor down to half as I decide to use Roost as he sets up Light Screen. Buddy! If you expect Staraptor to be hitting your Pokemon with special attacks, then I've got Waterfront property in Topeka, Kansas to sell you. Anyway, Staraptor gets the sixth and final workup ready to go as he finally goes for Toxic, being healed off with the Petcha Berry as Aerial Ace blasts through Dustox, Heracross, Beautifly, Vespaquen, and finally Drapion to win while being at nearly full HP. Good stuff. Now for Bertha, it's as easy as leading Roserade, as it's able to KO Quagsire with Giga Drain following setting up a Growth, taking half damage from Earthquake but healing it off immediately, then doing the same to Whizcash despite the Rindo Berry, lowering the strength of my attack, KOing it just as well as Pseudowoodo, leading to Golem. Now barring a critical hit, we do survive Earthquake, so I just go for Giga Drain, triggering Sturdy and taking a non-crit Earthquake into the red, healing back to over half with the next Giga Drain following a full restore, then KOing with the third and final Giga Drain as Hippowdon comes out last, sets up Sandstorm with the Sandstream ability, and dies to Giga Drain to win me the fight. You really don't need setup moves if everything just ends up falling like dominoes. Though moving into Flint, I think he's going to be the most challenging League member. While yes, I have Luminion, that doesn't help much when I can't really set up anything. Thankfully though, Surf does take care of both Rapidash and Steelix, managing for the former to hit Poison Jab and the latter to not hit anything because it's a piece of crap, one-shotting both as the latter also doesn't have Sturdy, leading to low punny. Now, I'm absolutely expecting a Mirror Coat here since I've used two special attacks in a row, so I opt for Rain Dance to increase the power of Surf for hopefully a one-shot KO, though he goes for High Jump Kick, doing rather decent damage to Luminion, but I have enough HP to survive a second one, so I'm fine with just going for Surf, doing so, but not quite getting the one-shot. 
Well, shoot, that's not good if it's Mirror Coat, but really good if it's High Jump Kick and it misses, picking up that last bit of damage required to KO and leading to Drift Limb. Well, this guy doesn't have any attacking moves, so it's literally just Strength Sap, Will-O-Wisp, Baton Pass, and Minimize. And while Surf doesn't quite get the job done in one shot, he just goes straight for Baton Pass after triggering Citrus Berry, going into Infernape while draining a turn on the Rain Dance. All good though, as I can just swap into Spiritomb, then I remember I forgot to swap Dark Pulse out for Psychic. All well and good, I can at least break the Focus Sash here with Shadow Ball, hitting two of them and bringing him below half as the rain elapses, and he gets in both a Thunder and Fire Punch, doing big damage, but not enough to bring Spiritomb out of the yellow as I swap into Staraptor on a Fire Punch, intimidating him so that I can survive both that and a Thunder Punch combo, hanging on with just 15 HP in order to KO with Aerial Ace and leave just Drift Blim. Now while I'd like to stay in here, I don't think I want to risk Will-O-Wisp KOing Staraptor if Aerial Ace can't KO Drift Blim from this point, so I just opt to swap for Jinx, leading to a Minimize but not mattering as Ice Beam still connects through the plus 2 evasion to KO and win the third of the Elite 4 matches. And in case you were wondering, this Drift Blim had Unburden rather than Aftermath, but that was still enough for me to want to swap out. Anyway, no losses yet. Let's see if we can keep that up with the last two fights against Lucian and Cynthia. Would be nice to make up for that literal last minute fumble of shield. He leads Mr. Mime and I lead Spiritomb, and while this might seem weird since this is a fairy type with Stab Dazzling Gleam, the only type that hits Spiritomb for super effective damage, I figure the rest of the team isn't going to be able to do jack all to it. Of course, resto chesto strats here to ensure I can survive plenty of dazzling gleams during the early stages of special defense setup, doing so and waking up before Lucian opts to swap for giraffe rig expecting to blank a ghost type attack, but that's what Dark Pulse is here for baby. Giraffe rig goes down after landing a thunderbolt for minimal damage leading to Metacham as it's the only good physical attacker of his team. Doesn't matter too much though as Thunder Punch only brings Spiritomb to just below half, letting me clean up the fight with Shadow Ball on Metacham, then on Alakazam following a Nasty Plot, then on Mr. Mime following a... a reflect? Dude, you literally set up Light Screen on the first turn of the fight. Why are you throwing? I mean, either way, it wouldn't have mattered since Shadow Ball gets a critical hit one shot on his last Pokemon, Bronzong, winning me the fight and leaving me with the 6 on 6, even playing field against Cynthia. I'm thinking I can just clean sweep her with Spiritomb due to her also leading with her own Spiritomb with no setup moves, so I'm just gonna go for it. Shockwave and Shadow Ball bring me home. As expected, I'm able to set up a few Calm Minds as she goes for Shadow Ball, but because the AI is dumb, she's now reading that Sucker Punch will do more damage than Shadow Ball, all while I'm going for status moves, not delivering a single attack while I finish my setup, use Rest, barely take any damage in the process since I'm actually out of Chesto Berries for this fight, and finally end this mirror match with a one-shot using Shadow Ball. Next up is Roserade, so one weak Dazzling Gleam later, and she's gone with Shadow Ball, leading to Gastrodon. Now sadly, despite outspeeding the slug, it's not quite a one-shot with plus six Shadow Ball, leading to a Rock Tomb that slows Spiritomb down just enough to make it so Gastrodon now at speeds. However, if I can just work through her Earthquake Power Points, made easy with pressure, only giving her five uses of the move rather than ten, I should be able to just rest Gastrodon out of the game and keep nearly full HP going into the latter half of her team. Sadly though, I have a brain fart following an early wake up thanks to the affection mechanic, meaning on the fifth and final use of Earthquake, bringing Spiritomb to just around half, I KO with Shadow Ball and undo the work I was trying to accomplish. Oh well, I should be fine anyway in the face of Milotic. Initially, I was worried about Mirror Coat here since I wanted to go to Rest to test for it, then I realized, oh, right, that's a Psychic type move and that technically doesn't work against Dark types, despite the move being different from other Psychic type moves. Uh, I don't really know. All I know is that it's not working, so I'm fine to just take a few Scalds while asleep, waking up on the literal first turn after using Rest and dishing out a Shockwave and Shadow Ball combination on the second turn to KO in two shots, leading to Lucario. She could do some damage here, but instead opts for Nasty Plot, allowing for Shadow Ball to pick up the KO before anything happens, leaving just Garchomp. Now I'm expecting Garchomp to go for Earthquake, and I'm kinda just hoping that Spiritomb survives. If it does, I KO with Shadow Ball. If it doesn't, it dies, and then I just go into my Luminion and outspeed to KO it with Ice Beam. But of course that would leave this game with a death. However, Affection decides to ruin the whole suspense of the moment by making Earthquake miss, allowing for Shadow Ball to pick up the easy, deathless victory, and win me this brilliant Diamond Hardcore Nuzlocke. Well then, that was, uh, that was far too easy. I remember this league being hellish in my first few playthroughs back when this game came out two years ago. 
I'd like a little more of a challenge, though, before we head out of Sinnoh. So, let's not abuse the Sphere Traders for the TMs like we did here, and instead take some time and strategize for Shining Pearl. Alright, so Shining Pearl is going to go pretty quickly, I think, considering we've got a lot of encounters front-loaded before Gardenia thanks to the Grand Underground, but we are stuck with only two before Rourke. After receiving Pokeballs, Bidoof is making her grand debut on the series in Route 201, getting Eevee trained in attack and speed, while Psyduck is in the Ravage Path, instead getting the special attack treatment. By the way, that Psyduck took me about 45 minutes of searching at 2 times speed to finally find one. I sure do heckin' love extremely low percentage encounter rates for no apparent reason. Anyway, Barry goes smoothly thanks to Beedoof's stab headbutt, one-shotting Starly after taking a quick attack and two-shotting Piplup following a pound to win. And with no other fights required between Barry and Rourke, I go ahead and edge them right up to the level cap with EV training and take them on with Psyduck. We just got Water Pulse by level up, so that makes Geodude a one-shot, then Onyx nearly a one-shot because of Sturdy, only being hit with a Rock Throw before a potion doesn't fully heal, KOing with the second, and leaving just Kranidos to be outsped and KO'd with Water Pulse to easily win, evolving Bidoof straight after. I can't say that I'm really a big fan of the repeated types so early on in this run, but with the level cap increased and our EVs fully maxed out, we can head into our last major fight before the Grand Underground is opened up, taking on Mars in the Valley Windworks. Admittedly, I do a dumb decision starting out here with Bibarel, setting up a defense curl to boost the power of Rollout as she misses with Supersonic. Though the Rollout does one-shot the Zubat as Perugly comes out second, I quickly realized that that was stupid because she hits Fake Out, and I probably should have just gone for Headbutt Spam. I shift over to it next turn and two-shot the Perugly after it manages to hit two Light Scratches, even through the Held Ornberry, to win the fight. Really can't ask for much more, but one quick stealth mission through Route 205 and an escort mission through Eterna Forest later. Not that kind of escort, that's not what Cheryl's doing. And we're finally... <laughs> what the f***? That wasn't even in the script, I just said that. We're finally equipped with the Explorer Kit, ready to find the rest of my team for at least the early to mid game, since there are a few encounters that become available much later that I'd like to take advantage of. Firstly, Houndoom in the Spacious Cave will be Eevee trained in Special Attack and Speed, as it has access to great moves like Nasty Plot, Flamethrower, and Dark Pulse. Secondly, Combi's over in the Grassland Cave, and Vespaquen is actually more of a defensive tank despite its typing, so I'll be Eevee training it in Defense and Special Defense to act as the team's support. Also, I figured I'd grab it down here instead of with the Honey Tree encounters above ground since A, that takes too much time, and B, since these are overworld encounters, I can tell the gender differences before running into them, so I was easily able to snatch up a female combi without any issues. Thirdly, we've got Krogunk in the Swampy Cave, getting Eevee trained as a physical attacker, and finally Pinsir in the Riverbank Cave, also seeing Eevees in attack and speed. That should cover what I'm looking for for now, though I might come back down here and search for the armor fossil should I need a better tank than Vespaquen. Also, since I've already demonstrated three games in a row just being kind of brain dead due to easy TR and TM access, like I said, I figured I'd challenge myself here and not grab super overpowered moves until late game, only grabbing a reasonable TM for this point in the game in Pluck so that Bibarel could have a super effective attack for the battle against Gardenia. But honestly, I don't even think I need Bibarel thanks to Vespaquen having the perfect resistance as a bug flying type, taking out both her lead Cherubi as well as Turtwig with one bug bite each, leading to Rosary. Since this gal has a Citrus Berry, I figured it would make sense to go with the neutral Bug Bite instead of Gust, so that I could eat that up and heal off whatever damage she inflicts this turn, doing so following a Grass Knot, and since Bug Bite did over half, another one following a Mist Stun Spore cleans up the KO, earning me the Forest Badge in the process. See, we don't need overpowered TMs to beat the game, we just need to use our brains and available encounters to do so. Speaking of which, Houndoom is actually an amazing resistance to everything that Jupiter has, especially since I caught it while knowing Thunderfang, being an easy super effective one-shot on Zubat as Skuntank comes in second. The only attacking moves this skunk has are Flamethrower and Snarl, both of which are resisted so I'm easily able to wail away with Thunderfang, and despite it doing just shy of a quarter damage each time, the first manages to both get Paralysis and the Flinch, letting me just continue laying in while Skuntank is able to poison me with Poison Gas. Thankfully though, it's not able to dish out enough damage as a grand total of 6 Thunderfangs through a Citrus Berry get the KO on Skuntank, surviving the Aftermath ability on just a few HP to win the fight. Probably could have stood to swap there, but honestly it didn't matter since Aftermath wouldn't have triggered if I had missed and not KO'd, so there really wasn't any risk involved. Anyway, on to Heart Home City. 
Barry lies in heart home and once again is not difficult. Starting Starly against my Houndoom, I go for Thunderfang, of course being dodge, as he goes for Endeavor for around a third, but a second manages to land with its 95% accuracy, KOing and leading to Printlop. Yeah, easy swap here into B-Barrel to resist any water moves, though he does instead go for Stealth Rock, so I technically get a free switch, hit it with Headbutt for over half and flinch, then KO with a second and lead to Roselia. Headbutt's a one-shot here, as it is nearly on Ponyta as well, hitting Flame Charge and a Growl for some reason, but it's all good since two Headbutts are more than enough to take this horse out to pasture, winning me the fight and letting me move up through Route 209, the Lost Tower, Salacion Town, Route 210, and Route 215 before hitting Veilstone for finally some actual TMs. I might be restricting myself from the Grand Underground, but these are mine. It's about time I finally have an actual fire type move on Houndoom. Ice Beam and Psychic are fantastic for Psyduck as well. Roost is amazing for Vespiquen, especially when it gets a hold of Defend Order later on, so that we can just sit there, tank hits, and whittle down with the likes of Attack Order or Air Slash. Then of course Sword Stance is great for when Krogunk evolves, but for now it can only get work up, so I'll have to wait a bit for it to be truly useful. Then of course, Calm Mind for Psyduck, nearly finalizing the moveset since all we need now is Surf to make this thing truly ideal. Everything else is pretty standard, just coverage and setup moves, but not everything is quite game-breaking, so we should still have a little bit of a difficult time going through these mid-game gyms. Speaking of which, Maylene isn't too much of a struggle as I send in Krogunk first, setting up two workups as she goes for Light Screen, which does nothing in this instance, and Flash, which very much makes me want to stop using workup, so I go for Sucker Punch next turn to KO as Machoke enters second, going down to Low Sweep. Third out is Lucario, goes for bulk up, but dies to a critical low sweep to win me the fight. Probably didn't need that crit since it was already plus two, stab, and super effective, but I am all for rubbing salt into open wounds just to be a dickhead. Now with Crasher Wake, his lead Gyarados is a bit scary, but guess what? Well, you've got Thunderfang on Houndoom, so I lead with him and outspeed to hit it on the first turn for around 75%, leading to a brine that does a hair over a quarter, all while Wake starts going for super potions. This leads, of course, to Gyarados going to the red next turn since I'm outpacing the healing, then back into the yellow with a second super potion as I go for bite, finally going down to Thunderfang as Quagsire enters second. With him out though, I'm fine to just swap into Vespiquen, and because it's flying type, of course I'm going to be avoiding Mudshot, then swapping between the likes of Roost and Strugglebug to weaken the power of Scald and Mudshot like mad. Though he does have Haze to eliminate those stat changes, which I didn't really account for that much, so I decide to go for U-Turn out into Pinsir, all while Quagsire's in the red, outspeeding and KOing with Bug Bite to leave just Floatzel. And sure enough, this is a pretty simple endeavor with the barrel. Just go for yawn, then spam headbutt to win. Not bad. But how does Fantina go following the Cynthia Aaron running? Well, we do still have a rival battle first, but beforehand I went ahead and taught the Houndoom nasty plot through the move reminder here in Pastoria. Thank you, Heart Scales from the Grand Underground, basically giving me the perfect killing machine for this team. I set up not one, but two of them following an Endeavor and Quick Claw proc into Pluck that does pretty good damage to Houndoom, so I cut the setup there and start going for Flamethrower to get the job done, KOing Starly, and then chickening out once he brings in Plurinplup because I don't know if I'm an outspeed. God, what I wouldn't give for Dark Pulse though. Anyway, I just bring in Vespiquen and click things until it dies. What? I've got Roost, why do I need to think with a tank? Other than that, I just bring in Psyduck to KO Ponyta with Water Pulse and Roselia with Psychic to win the fight. With him out of the way, and with the TM for Shadow Ball available on Route 210 heading into Celestic Town, I have at least a super effective special move that should take care of Fantina's team that's usable by Houndoom, especially when it can't get burned by her lead Driftblim's Will-O-Wisp. In fact, I'm given a blessing here while I set up with Nasty Plot as she goes for Strength Sap, lowering Houndoom's physical attack in the event that I inevitably get outsped by her bastard Gengar and get confused with Confuse Ray, so I can just stay in and keep trying to click the win button in the effort to not have to think. Sure enough, once my setup is complete though, Houndoom is hit with a single fly for around 40%, KOing with Shadow Ball before doing the same thing to Gengar following said Confuse Ray, then snapping out following a Miss Magius Dazzling Gleam that brings Houndoom to the low yellow in order to KO with Shadow Ball to win. It really was the perfect Pokemon for this fight. Couldn't get burned, resisted ghost types, neutrality to fairy coverage due to the fire typing. What more could I have asked for aside from Stab Dark Pulse? Anyway, there's literally zero gap between this and Byron with the exception of another rival fight, which once again is obliterated, this time by the newly evolved Golduck. 
I don't even have to set up for this one actually, as Ice Beam KOs Staravia, Psychic KOs Roselia, Prinplup takes Psychic pretty well, doing less than half on the first one, but being crit on the second one, so who cares, leading to Heracross, who's outsped and hit into the red by Psychic, only nailing a Brick Break for around 40% before going down to a second, leaving just Ponyta to die to Surf. It is so nice to finally see Golduck be useful instead of as a frail Psyduck, and the same goes for Krogunk as it finally evolves in Byron's Gym, proving to be useful against one of the trainers that for some reason has an Azumarill in the Steel-type Gym. Uh, you do you, bud, but that just leaves Byron. I lead off with Houndoom in order to avoid the setup of Trick Room, Sandstorm, and Confuse Ray with Bronzor, KOing in one shot with Flamethrower and leading to Steelix. Well, this thing doesn't have a Rock-type move, but it does have Earthquake, and it has Sturdy, so the obvious move is to swap into Vespaquen to avoid the damage, then start alternating between Air Slash and Roost in order to potentially flinch Steelix and hit for its pathetically weak special defense, though this does go poorly once Thunderfang ends up getting the Paralysis, forcing me out into Golduck to KO with Surf and leave just Bastiodon. Well then, good thing for me then that Bastiodon can't attack if its life depends on it, because it is just really bad at anything besides taking attacks that, you know, aren't Surf, because it dies to two of them, winning me the fight in pretty easy fashion. Not bad, didn't need setup, just walls and things that hit hard. Now before I can head up to Lucky Gym number 7, I've got to take out some Galactic Admins, with Saturn being a simple sweep thanks to Houndoom having perfect moves to take out the entire team, going for Shadow Ball on... Toxicroak? Uh, he swapped out of Kadabra since this thing can literally not do a single thing to Houndoom. But this Toxicroak has dry skin, so the next turn Flamethrower does double damage and KOs easily. Then all I have to do is Flamethrower Bronzor and Shadow Ball Kadabra to win. On to Lake Verity, and hilariously, I can actually just take these grunts down in double battles to waste less time. All because Golduck has Surf and Toxicroak has dry skin. So I don't even have to use Protect to block the damage, ensuring that both Pokemon are KO'd every turn as I get to Mars. Once again, we're looking at a sweep with Houndoom against her lead Golbat, as Nasty Plot is able to be set up before Golbat goes for U-Turn. Bastard, you were supposed to go for Stab Poison Fang. That should have done more damage than neutral non-Stab U-Turn, but of course I'm only able to get one Nasty Plot up before Thick Fat Perugly comes in to be an asshole and not die to one Flamethrower. It hits Slash to bring Houndoom to around 25% HP remaining, but the second Flamethrower KOs and leaves both Golbat and Bronzor to die to one Flamethrower each to win. Once again, Dark Pulse would have done the trick, but the Perugly can't be hit by Shadow Ball and I don't have that yet, so Thick Fat Ability, thank you for being an asshole. Anyway, enough complaining for one galactic guillotining, just gotta head through routes 216 and 217 to get into Snowpoint City and challenge... Yeah, I'm still trying to blank here, sorry. But Ice is not a type I'm worried about in the slightest. All I have to do is lead Toxicroak, set up three Swords Dances, take Avalanches and heal with a Citrus Berry, and top it off with Drain Punch on Snover as Sneasel enters second. Now this bastard has Dig, which will KO, and I don't outspeed. However, I can use the resisted non-stab Sucker Punch to get the priority advantage, still managing to KO and bringing in Metacham third, which goes down to the same move. Last out is a Boma Snow, which goes down to a super effective Drain Punch to win me the Icicle Badge. Just like I cycled literally nothing out of my party because I'm too lazy to grab new Pokemon. Though admittedly, just about everything that I could grab now is also in Legends Arceus, and I'm not really sure what I want to grab in preparation for Volo in that game, so I may as well just use these guys until they die or something. Now then, it's time for Endgame, and honestly, I think now is as good a time as any to finally get those TMs I've been holding myself back from in the Grand Underground. Finally gaining good coverage moves like Earthquake, or frickin' Dark Pulse for Houndoom. Anyway, gotta raid the Veilstone HQ real quick, kick this man's blue hair pronouns and Pokemon down his throat, and do the same for a slightly edgier dark blue hair friend down the hallway. Cyrus starts out with Murkrow, and yeah, this is just a sweep with Houndoom. One nasty plot leads to a taunt, but plus two flamethrower destroys Murkrow, Golbat, and Sneasel all in one shot, so it doesn't matter. Same goes for Saturn, as I go for Dark Pulse on turn one, only to run into the swap from Kadabra for Toxic Rogue yet again. Ounce beating next turn and KOing a flamethrower, then doing the same to Bronzor, and Dark Pulse Kadabra to win. I mean, this is just how these guys go. They all suck. They all are really bad at their friggin' jobs. I'm better than them, and they know it. <laughs> There's nothing more to it. Even Mars and Jupiter don't have much in the way of stopping me here as I lead Houndoom against both Bronzors in the multi-battle with Barry, all while they set up Confuse Ray on Houndoom and Light Screen. But Houndoom doesn't hit itself once while we get to plus six with Nasty Plot. 
KOing Jupiter's bronze ore all while Munchlax doesn't hit itself either, and KOs the other bronze ore with four bites in a row, leaving neither of us confused afterwards and making it easy for me to flamethrower Mars's Progly and Golbat, doing the same to Jupiter's Skuntank and Golbat right after to win. Admittedly, both Pokemon not hitting themselves in Confusion, only to KO both Bronzors on the same turn, made for an extremely easy fight, but even if that didn't happen and I had to deal with another Confuse Ray, it still would have been likely as just as easy. But with some yummy frustration berries on top, just to waste more of my time. Oh, with them out of the way, all that remains is Cyrus, and were you expecting much else? I mean, Houndoom set up two flame charges for speed against Honchro, then two nasty plots for special attack, all while he wastes time with random moves like Defog to lower Houndoom's evasiveness, only hitting a critical Night Slash for around half as Flamethrower KOs Honchro, Dark Pulse KOs Gyarados, then I swap for Vespaquen on Weavile since I know he's going for Dig and I may as well get up a free Defend Order. After several turns of Defend Order and Roost, I'm good to go for Attack Order, nearly one-shotting thanks to super effective damage, doing so next turn, then leaving just Crobat to be outpaced in damage by Defend Order and Roost, KOing in a few Air Slashes to win the fight. I love defenders that just sit there and keep attacking until things are dead after they set up their defense moves. Gotta be one of my favorite genders. Anyway, Master Ball, get in the box forever, you space-controlling freak. I have one more badge to get, and Faulkner is not that hard, really. Sure, the fight takes a bit of messing around to make things happen, but not so much that it's a complex strategy that requires mastery of the game's mechanics or whatever. Instead, I lead Golduck against his Raichu, taking a Volt Switch for around 75% before bringing in Ambipom, only to die to Surf, so I then bring in Houndoom as he brings back in Raichu to force him to Volt Switch again into Octillery. Then I swap into Toxicroak on an Octazooka to take no damage because of Dry Skin, then set up two Sword Stances while he sets up Focus Energy and Charge Beam, getting a critical hit plus the special attack boost which does like 75% to Toxicroak. Not to worry though, as Drain Punch one-shots from this position, bringing Toxicroak well over half as Raichu comes back in and goes down to Sucker Punch, leaving just Luxray. But of course, not before the literal only chance that Raichu has to trigger Static. Again, it's a 30% chance not to paralyze. Damn game designers. Well, since I'm frustrated by RNG being a bastard again and don't want to think, I just click Sucker Punch again despite being clearly at risk of being KO'd by Luxray just so the battle ends and it works and I win. One day the game will just let me do this without risking my Pokemon to death? Who am I kidding? These games have such a grudge against me considering how many times I've beaten them and their children. Well, with that arguably gruesome image of me beating Red and Blue as the matriarch and patriarch of the family, all while Sun Gold and Daughter Silver wait in line for their bludgeoning, it's an easy trek through Victory Road, leaving just half a dozen trainers standing in front of me. God, now I'm just imagining myself beating the shit out of people. You know, I think we've gone too far. Barry is once again easy after bringing my team up to level 61, giving me a 12 level advantage over Staraptor and a 6 level advantage against his ace Torterra, cutting through his team like a hot knife through butter thanks to Golduck and Calm Mind, KOing Roserade with Surf following a Staraptor U-turn into, you know, the freaking thing that died, two-shotting Staraptor with Surf after dodging a close combat since this thing had a Focus Sash for some reason, KOing Rapidash with Surf, obliterating Empoleon with two resisted Surfs, drowning Snorlax with two more despite its use of Yawn, finally putting Golduck to sleep as his last Pokemon in Heracross is brought in. Oh, well, perfect time for Team Forerunner Houndoom to come in and burn it alive with Flamethrower to win me the fight. Hmm, uh, maybe I should tone down the gruesome description of these fights. After all, YouTube might flag me for inappropriate content despite playing a video game intended for all ages. Nah, it's more funny this way. I'm on a killing spree and Eren's the first to go, leading Houndoom with a Petra Berry against this Dustox that just refuses to go for Toxic on turn one, allowing me to set up three Nasty Plots, all while he goes for Light Screen and two Bug Buzzes, doing less than half total as I go for Flame Charge, doing over half with one of them surprisingly as he finally goes for Toxic, healing it off with the Petra Berry, and since Flame Charge did over half last turn, I just go for the second one to be on the safe side, getting to plus two speed and making it easy for Houndoom to burn Heracross, Beautifly, Vespaquen, and Drapion all alive while each sits in line waiting in shock as all of their friends are burned in front of them. Such a beautiful sight. Kinda reminds me of Squid Game. Except I've never watched that show and I've only watched the compilation of all those people getting gunned down. That was neat. 
Thankfully, old Grandma Bertha puts up a little bit more of a fight, with Quagsire taking like five headbutts to go down from the barrel, but two of those ended up being flinches as I set up Swords Dance during the turn that she healed with a full restore, letting me use two more to KO through a Toxic that was thankfully healed by another Pecha Berry. Great, now Sudowoodo dies to Waterfall and Whiskash to two headbutts, leading to Golem. Now, with Sturdy being in my way and Bibarel barely having any HP left, I'm kind of just at the point of, screw it, let this thing die, I'm not going to use it anymore. So I do that, and get the safe switch into my Mold Breaker Pincer, so that Earthquake can just one-shot Golem without working through Sturdy, leaving just Hip Out on. I mean, I should probably be able to three-shot this with X Scissor, and should is the keyword, as Bertha takes the time to use Rest, healing Hip Out on completely after two of them, and waking up with a Chesto Berry, hitting two crunches in total that bring Pincer down to just 12 HP after Sandstorm damage. From here, I just swap into Golduck and drown it with Surf. You give me sand, I dampen it, and shove it down your throat as mud. Man, all this depravity is really making me want a therapy session. Even though I'm trying, I can't be Shadow the Hedgehog with his nice cock and AK-47 mowing down soldiers on the highway while casually riding a Harley Davidson. God, I've really lost the plot at this point. There's only three more fights left, and I can stop talking about nonsense. Oh, I don't know, maybe I can go bully some children by playing Kashira in Master Duel or something. Flint's up next, and I lead Houndoom. Not too surprising considering I want to resist fire here, but Rapidash actually outspeeds and lands Hypnosis turn one, though I did come prepared with a Hell Chesto Berry to set up Nasty Plot. Can't really risk setting up more without getting my back walls blown out, so I just go for Dark Pulse next turn, taking around half from Poison Jab before KOing, and leading to Low Pony, who's outsped and KO'd the Flamethrower. Third is a sturdy list Steelix, made easy with Flamethrower, leading to Driftlim, who too just goes down to Dark Pulse, leaving just Infernape. Now I'm expecting a Fighting-type move to take advantage of the Dark Saving here, so I swap into Vespaquen to resist Mach Punch, dodging a Fire Punch next turn to hit Air Slash, and because of that, I'm given a free KO, because the second Fire Punch next turn does well over half, but not enough to KO, so that second Air Slash is... You know, it just kills the fighting type. That's the, <laughs> that's what we're supposed to do. Shut down the illegal smoking facility. And again, that might not be as bad as the think tank just ahead with Lucian and his Brainiac psychic types. Once again, I'm leading Houndoom, immune to psychic and neutral to fairy, so setting up three nasty plots as he goes for dual screens and dazzling gleam with his lead Mr. Mime for less than half damage makes my life easy. Then going for flame charge for very minimal damage, but getting plus one speed all while a second dazzling gleam puts Houndoom in the red, only to be undone completely by a held Mago Berry. Plus one should be plenty enough to outspeed this entire team, so Mr. Mime goes down to Dark Pulse, Metacham to Flamethrower, Girafferig to Dark Pulse, Alakazam also to Dark Pulse, and finally Bronzong to Flamethrower since this thing's Rock and Levitate instead of Heatproof. You'd think that they would have changed the ability on at least one of the major trainers like Bronzors or Bronzongs, but legitimately every single major galactic fight and Lucian all have Levitate instead of Heatproof. But I can't be asked to care anymore, because all that remains is Cynthia, and while yes, we are going 5 on 6 at a little bit of a disadvantage, I think we should be completely fine considering her lead Pokemon Spiritomb cannot do more than not very effective damage to Houndoom, so I should be able to set up Nasty Plot and Flame Charge to outspeed everything. However, hindsight is 2020, and that is not what I do. Instead, I decide I haven't given Golduck enough time to shine in this league, so why not use Calm Mind and tank all of those special moves while giving it a Mago Berry to ensure we keep rather healthy for this fight? So, let's see how that goes. Spirit Tomb's up first, and of course, the Calm Mind outspeeds it naturally, and Dark Pulse does around a third, so a second and third are set up as she starts going for Sucker Punch. Now, that was bound to happen with the special defense boost, but once all five are drained, I can go for Surf, KOing Spiritomb, then Psychic to KO Roserade, then Gastrodon, leading to Lucario fourth. This too is a special attacker, so after going for Aura Sphere that puts me in berry range, Golduck gets back into the green as Surf KOs the second biggest furry bait behind Flint's Low Pony, leading to Milotic. Now, thankfully, the AI is dumb and does not register the fact that I have been using special moves this entire time, so despite Psychic barely missing the one-shot, Cynthia opts for Scald, a resisted move, over Mirror Coat, a guaranteed KO. Good job, Moron, now she's locked into wasting all of her Hyper Potions on Milotic. Is what I would say if it weren't for a special defense drop that came from Psychic. While this might be convenient on the surface, this actually spells disaster for me with Garchomp. See, she outspeeds and KOs Golduck with Earthquake, 
And sure, we can go into Pinsir and hit X Scissor for some chip damage before dying to two Dragon Claws, but then Toxicroak comes in with Sucker Punch and barely does anything to this gal before dying to Earthquake. Well, uh, we're down to two Pokemon and nothing that outspeeds Garchomp, so out to Vespiquen we go as we attempt to fight back against Sword Stance with Defend Order and Roost, then going for Attack Order and leading to that extra full restore that was left due to that damn special defense drop. If that wasn't there, we would have won the fight with two members left on the team, but it's just fruitless. She's able to outdamage Vespiquen, though not before a critical attack order brings her back into the mid-yellow, KOing and leaving just Houndoom to surely be picked off by a plus two Earthquake to end the run in the series. But the game refused. Thank you, Affection, for busting me out of a surefire loss as Earthquake misses and Houndoom is able to finish Garchomp off with a Dark Pulse, winning me a fight that I had zero and probably a negative of right to win and allow me to move on to the last three games of the franchise. I don't deserve this whatsoever at all, and honestly, there's no more chaotic beatball way of winning a Nuzlocke than just straight up pulling a Deus Ex Machina out of my asshole. And... <laughs> <laughs> Surprised that thing didn't rupture my intestines, it was that huge. So I suppose that's not quite the end of our adventures in the Sinnoh region. Sure, we're in ancient times next go-around, but Hisui, Sinnoh, same area. Now you might be wondering, hold on, why is Legends Arceus getting its own video? Isn't that game rather short with the amount of battles needed? Well, that's for two reasons. Firstly, the game takes a rather long time to finish due to needing to capture the entire Pokedex to get to the actual end boss of the Nuzlocke. And the second is that I'll be doing a double header with the next video. Since we need to capture all those Pokemon, I figured I'd finally get around to completing Professor Oak's challenge in Legends Arceus. So those two videos will be coming out back to back before the release of the final video in Scarlet and Violet. Assuming I don't have what just happened in this game happen again. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, then click on one of these other videos on screen, you'll probably enjoy them too. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel, it really helps, and if you want to help support the content, leaving a super thanks in the comments below is the best way to support the channel, whether or not you're leaving a challenge request. With that all being said, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.